courtesy uh, know, and he will kick me and I'll talk louder, I suppose, uh, for something to throw your water bottle at me. So everyone, welcome. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about graduate study in the UK and the fellowships that Austin National Fellowships works with that could help support you in this endeavor. My name is Craig Filer. I am the director of Austin National Fellowships as well as one of the associate deans undergraduate studies here at Florida State. Uh, I'm also joined by Jesse over hey. here. I don't know if you can see him or not. I don't know what the camera is. Um, so, so he'll be giving us, yeah, come on in. Uh, he'll be giving us a little bit of an overview of the second half of the program. Hey, uh, sign in, have a seat, just getting started. We're doing this multimedia today. <laughs> oh, I can't get this to work again. Oh, did it? Yes. Uh, here, let's go. There. There we go. All right. That's something. All right. So, I don't know that projectors are more things here. I know. Yeah. Uh, all right, so we're having some technical difficulties. We're going to be fine. All right, so we're going to go over the roads, the marshes, the Mitchell, the Fulbright, and the Gates, Cambridge Scholarship today. This is a little bit of a whirlwind, and it's really just meant to be an introduction because there are five scholarships. They all basically cover the same thing. They all sort of are looking for the same thing with small little differences. And so to that end, it's easiest to start with what are the commonalities between these programs. So that you have an idea of what the baseline is in terms of the programs, the applications, and what they are looking for in candidates. And so you do have to be a rising graduating senior. All of these awards are for graduate study, so you do need to have a bachelor's degree at the time the award starts. So that means the earliest you can apply is your senior year. The timelines of these are such that you would complete the applications early in your senior year for the following year. And so we work way ahead on this. This is 18 months ahead of the time any of these would start. And so this does require a little bit of long range planning. If you're in your junior year and next year is your senior year, this is the perfect window for you to start thinking about these. If you're a little bit younger in your first year or second year, this is still all great information to have. If you happen to be a senior who's graduating in two months, that is okay as well, because you will have a bachelor's degree. So you can still apply for these awards as a recent alumnus. Now, uh, each of them, depending on which one it is, it's going to be for one to two years of studying graduate work in the UK or Ireland. Uh, we'll differentiate which or which, but it's basically to get a master's program. Some of them will allow you to start a doctoral program, but they will not fund you all the way through to the end in every case. Depending on the, the program, you're going to need at least three letters, but up to eight letters of recommendation. These are mostly academic letters or a combination of academic and character references. For these, most of them need a university endorsement. In other words, there is some sort of nomination or vetting process that our office facilitates that requires either an evaluation form or requires a letter. It also would require an interview from you with a faculty committee. This does not apply to all of them, but it does apply to most. Each of these has a strong essay component to them. And it's some combination, <coughs> excuse me, of academic writing, as well as discussing service and leadership, as well as personal writing. And so depending on the award, it'll parse it out in different ways, but there is a substantive amount of writing for each of these that touches on these areas. Now, in terms of what they're looking for in applicants, you can see here, we sort of went this down to a few key points. The first is they're looking for students who have a strong intellect, character, leadership, and morality, as well as motivation and a seriousness of purpose. And then finally, a potential to make significant societal contributions, whatever your field happens to be. And I like to end on that point because oftentimes students will look at this award program and be like, well, I'm not sure if I'm the type of student that they're looking for. And they really are looking for students from almost any discipline that want to try and impact the world through their particular lens. Now, I will add the caveat that most of these programs that they will support for graduate work are not going to be pre-professional programs. You know what I mean by that is you will not find funding to go to law school as a Marshall Scholar or Rhodes Scholar. You won't find it to go to med school. Right now, this would make sense if you unpack it for just a second, because most of you probably aren't considering practicing law in the UK, which is what getting a law degree would be. And so if your plan is eventually to go to med school or to law school or MBA program or something like that here in the US, you are still eligible for 
this award. In fact, one of our Rhodes Scholars was a pre-med student, and they were thinking about what master's program could I take that would actually enhance my ability to be a stronger medical student and eventually a stronger doctor. And what he determined was that he was going to go to Oxford and pursue a degree in medical anthropology, which taught him about how to interact with various cultures through the medical lens that he then took on to become a doctor. He's now a neurosurgeon, so his pivot uh, happened in med school. But still, he thought very critically about how he would be best served and how he would be able to best serve by getting a master's education in the UK before he returned for his medical degree. Oftentimes, that'll work too if you're considering a PhD here in this country to consider getting a, an adjacent or some sort of um, master's program that will enhance what you eventually want to do with your PhD. All right, a few other commonalities. You can see here, uh, in, enable the intellectually distinguished Americans to send the UK. Ireland means they want you to have good grades. They want to see record of distinction in academics. Oftentimes they're wanting to see research or some other sort of engaged learning in your particular field. They want you to improve the world, not only through your academic discipline, but also through your leadership and your service skills. They want to see broadening worldviews and how you address issues across difference. They also want to strengthen international relations. Many of these awards are founded on the ideas of international cooperation, and they want to see how you will foster those goals and those ideals through the work that you do. And then, of course, personal and academic fulfillment through leadership and service to the community. How have you served our community here as a student? How will that carry over to the service and leadership you'll provide as a student in the UK? And then how does that carry back to your time after the degree program itself? All right. <clears throat> so what I'm going to do now is going to start going through each of the awards in turn, basically in two parts. There'll be a little bit about the award itself, just sort of what is the ethos, what are they looking for, and then a little bit about what the application entails what does it require and what type of work will you have to do? Again, after the second or third one, you'll start realizing these sound really, really similar. And what I really hope you take away from this presentation is just a brief understanding of what the scope of the awards are. You can find a place where you might have the point of entry to be interested, but don't worry about the minutia at that point. That is what we are here to help you keep track of. Oftentimes, students will come to us with an interest in one of the awards. We'll start working on it. We'll say, hey, this might also work really well with a few adaptations into one of these other programs. Or you might come to us because you're interested in one program. And as we start to work on it, we realize that one of the others might be a better fit for you. And so there's no expectation that you have a comprehensive understanding of all of this. That is why we are here to help. But more importantly, it's about what is interesting to you about this and how might you engage with graduate study in the UK in a way that feels authentic and correct for you. So the first one is the Marshall Scholarship. So the Marshall Scholarship, what does it provide? Excuse me very much. So uh, basically, all of these are full rides for all intents and purposes. It's the easiest way to think about it. They're going to cover your tuition and your living expenses. There's not price tags attached to these because depending on the city you're living in, the degree program you're pursuing, the amount will be different. And so it's just easiest to think about these as your expenses will be covered during the duration of your award program. It may not allow you to live large, but you should be able to live in such a way that you can focus on going there and doing the things that the award wants you to do, which is study and become an active member of that community. You can see here, it will cover grants, it will cover uh, books, research, all that sort of thing. They'll let you get back home a few times over the course of your time there. And then uh, if you have a spouse, there is the opportunity with Marshall to have spousal support. And of course, all of these have an alumni network, which is just phenomenal. The alumni network, uh, in this case, decades worth of alumni, they are going to be there to help support you and mentor you, not only as a Marshall scholar, but as you become part of the Marshall alumni network as well. The application for this one, uh, all of them, of course, will require an official transcript. This one, actually, uh, they just changed this. We need to change this to PowerPoint. This one's three letters of recommendation now. And then there's three essays here. There's a personal statement. Uh, actually, take that back. This one changed, too. Uh, four essays here. We'll get this changed in the PowerPoint before we send it out. There is a personal statement. There is an ambassadorial essay. There is an academic essay. And then there's a leadership essay. And so each of those areas, in turn, 
will be spoken about. Uh, basically, it used to be three, and they separated two out. The leadership and the ambassador essay used to be one, and they put it in two separate ones because they were getting a lot of um, cross wires, and they realized they needed to make four separate essays there. Um, but it didn't really increase your word count, which is nice. For all of these, you to eligible uh, on the first few, you have to be a US citizen. They're looking for American citizens to study abroad as a Marshall Scholar. Again, you have to have completed your first bachelor's degree by the time the awards start. So that's what I talked about before. You can be a rising senior, you can apply before you've graduated. But in order to be eligible this year, you must have a bachelor's degree by the end of academic year 2024 next year. For Marshall, it's a 3.7 minimum GPA, but usually a really competitive one is going to be even a little bit higher than that. And so it doesn't mean if you don't have a 3.7 that there's nothing for us here to work with. Just pay attention. They fluctuate uh, depending on the award that we're talking about. And you cannot have studied for or hold a degree from a British university. If you did study abroad in London, you're fine. That doesn't count. If you did some sort of exchange program for a semester in a British university, also you're fine. That doesn't count. What they mean is you are not a full-time student at a British university for multiple semesters in pursuit of a degree there and then transferred back here to Florida State. That's what you cannot do. So the deadlines for these are all going to be very similar as well. Um, we don't have exact dates because these applications haven't opened yet. So we're just relying on our past, um, our past work. They've sent us some notifications on this, but they usually release the applications April, give or take. So we do have something called a pre-application. We'll open that, and that's going to be due in early June. The pre-application for all of these is just simply, are you interested? Who are you? Why are you interested? How do we get in contact with you? It's very straightforward and a, hopefully a non, uh, it's, it's not a threatening or a difficult document at all. It's just like, you know, I'm sort of interested in the Marshall because I'd like to study political science at Cambridge for this reason. That's all we need to get started in the pre-application. Then um, what we'll do is over the course of the summer, we work on the materials for the application. I usually put in another deadline before the campus one, um, which would be uh, probably early July, which would be, uh, let's make sure I've seen your first drafts by now. Most people have already seen them by then, but we'll usually put in some place where like, if you haven't done first drafts by about five, six weeks out from the campus deadline, it's gonna be tough to pull this together because these applications do require some work. The campus deadline for each of these is your due date because we do have this internal process that I mentioned for all of these, where there's either an interview, some sort of review process, nomination process. We have to do these applications due before the semester even starts so that we have time to do the interviews, the review process, all of those sorts of steps for the national deadline, which for Marshall is usually late September. And so oftentimes you'll go onto these websites. And if you do that, we certainly encourage you to do that. If you see a deadline on there, Please understand that is our office's deadline, not yours, because of the university nomination process. So if you're going on to one of the awards we talk about today, please always double check with us to make sure when our campus deadline process is, because if you miss it, you may become ineligible to submit a national deadline. All right. So whereas the Marshall, and I sort of skip over this part because I like to do it as a compare contrast to Rhodes. The Marshall is set up so that you can do one or two years of study pretty much anywhere in the United Kingdom. If you can find a college there, most likely it is a partner institution and they are cool with you applying to do work at that university. It can be in London, it could actually be in Scotland, it can be anywhere except Ireland, uh, which we'll get to Ireland in a sec, but any university in the UK for one or two years. The Rhodes Scholarship has very similar aims in terms of they're looking for world leaders, they want people that have strong service, they want strong character, they want strong academics, but it is solely to study at Rhodes, at the Rhodes House at Oxford, right, as a Rhodes Scholar at Oxford, and so this is only to study Oxford University. So one of the first things that we'll talk about if you come and talk to us about this is, well, what do you want to study, where do you want to study? And oftentimes somebody will come and say, well, I want to be a Rhodes Scholar. I'm like, great, what do you want to study at Oxford? It's like, well, I don't want to go to Oxford. I'm like, well, then you don't want to be a Rhodes Scholar. Right? The two things are inextricably linked. And so if there's nothing that you really want to study at Oxford, then Rhodes Scholarship probably isn't for you. Marshall Scholarship probably is because we can find something for you to study. 
Whereas some folks will come in and they know that they want a very specific program at Oxford with this specific professor, and oftentimes Rhodes will be a good fit for them. You'll see this one's very similar to the other one. You got alumni network, you got funding, you got full expenses. Application is going to look very similar. You have the transcripts. This one requires five to eight letters of recommendation. It has to be a minimum of five, where the other is a minimum of three. This one is a minimum of five. There's a couple of writing pieces here, an academic essay, which is your proposed course of study, very similar to the one that's in Marshall, a personal statement, very similar to the one that's in Marshall. And rather than a leadership essay and an ambassador essay, here they just ask for a list of activities. Sorry, the closed caption box is in here. Rhodes requires this, uh, and this is a, a statement of personal responsibility. The interesting thing about Rhodes compared to all the others is we can workshop materials with you. This type of writing, this type of personal writing is very specific, and it's one that we discovered that not a lot of students have a lot of practice in, and we'll workshop these essays with you so that you can become familiar with the parlance of how to write about yourself. Rhodes, we cannot do that. We can give you general guidelines about how to do personal writing. We can answer general questions about the process. But Rhodes requires that you as an applicant receive no assistance whatsoever on your personal essay. That means your roommates cannot proofread it. That means your parents cannot give you feedback on it. Your professors, none of us. You have to sign this document that it's just you and you alone. We have some writing exercises that we, we give you that we'll work with you a little bit more intently on to give you some experience with that. Uh, but we do just like to point this out here. Nothing to be scared of because there's plenty of time and we'll make sure that you're in really good shape. But they do want to make sure that it is your work and your work alone. All right, uh, similar here. This one, you have to be a U.S. citizen. Uh, there's age limits on these. I don't put Marshall on there because it's 30 years old and it's usually not our student population. Although if you are a non-traditional student and you're getting uh, closer to 30, just touch base with us and make sure that you're still eligible. Uh, with this one, you can't be older than 24 at the time of application, which is at the beginning of October. And again, extraordinary intellectual distinction. And again, have your bachelor's degree in hand. Same idea. Uh, we have that early, early July, late uh, June time where we're going to need the pre application, see some essays. Uh, actually, not with this one, no see some essays. Uh, campus deadline again will be mid August, like literally around August 16th this year, I think. And then with this one, we have a national deadline. It'll be on October 3rd. All right, deep breath. Next one. So Marshall, all of the UK. Rhodes is specifically for Oxford. The Mitchell is specifically to study at one of the universities in Ireland. So whereas the UK, you can do Wales, you can do the UK, you can do Scotland, no Ireland. We have the Mitchell Scholarship if you're interested in studying in Ireland, uh, named after George Mitchell, who is ambassador to Ireland for a time. And they look for about eight students here on this one. Now, a couple of things are different about this one. Marshall could be one or two years. Rhodes is for two years. Mitchell is specifically for one year and one year only. So you'd have to find a one-year master's program here. Um, this one needs five letters of recommendation, uh, specifically as opposed to three or five to eight. This one is just a personal essay. So it's not quite as much writing. Similarly here, you'll notice the same thing, citizen, age limit, intellectual distinction, have to have a degree. Um, the pre-application, this is actually on their website, and I think it's already up and running. Um, and then the campus deadline, again, is mid-August with a national deadline end of September. All right, so, so it's going to be a little breakneck here. Marshall, all the UK, Rhodes, specifically Oxford, Mitchell, specifically Ireland, and then finally, of uh, these four, Gates Cambridge, which is specifically to study at Cambridge. Right, so you have a bunch of different options here. Some are very expansive, some are very limited. So Gates Cambridge was actually started by the Gates Foundation, uh, Bill and Melinda Gates, to provide a um, counterpoint in some respects to the Rhodes Scholarship at Oxford by creating one at Cambridge. And so it's the same idea, the same sort of rhetoric behind it in terms of they're looking for exceptional scholars and leaders and public servants to make a difference in the world. The big difference with this one is the application isn't actually a separate application. It's built into the Cambridge application and you get to supplemental materials. It's like, would you like to apply for Gates Cambridge? You say yes, and then there's actually an additional essay for Cambridge to be considered for Gates Cambridge. And so this one is the one where we don't actually have to have an official nomination from us as a university, but we work with you very closely on the application processes because it's very similar to all the others. 
same thing here. You can be a, a, a U.S. citizen, but this one is nice because you're applying to Cambridge itself. You don't have to be a U.S. citizen. You can be a citizen anywhere and apply to be part of the Gates of Cambridge as an international student at Cambridge. Because if you're an American citizen, you haven't thought about this, when you're applying to one of these programs, you become an international student in that country. And so you are uh, sort of following the rules and regulations of what international students must follow as a student in the UK. Similarly so here, uh, I choose gauge scores, and then the deadline for this one usually early, mid, early October. Now, this also has me point out this to you. Here you have to apply to Cambridge. In the other three that I just mentioned, you apply to the scholarship, and then if you receive the scholarship, they help you be admitted to the university. You have to be admissible, right? And so you have to meet the requirements of what that school requires, but if you're applying for Rhodes, you don't actually apply for Oxford. If you receive the Rhodes, then they work with Rhodes House to get you into Oxford in a program that will work for you. Similarly with Marshall, you have several choices as you put your applications to places you would like to go. Once you're awarded a Marshall, Marshall Commission works with the universities to get you placed and admitted. It's Cambridge, you apply to Cambridge, and if you get in, you get into Cambridge, and then you get to Gates Cambridge, you get to Gates Cambridge. Sometimes you've had students actually apply to Gates Cambridge and they get into Cambridge, but they don't get Gates Cambridge, and they still work with their international aid officer and figure out a way to finance it and end up going to Cambridge regardless. So that's such a bad thing. All right, so those are the first four, and I'm going to turn this over to Jesse in just a second to talk about Fulbright and to wrap us up. But the main thing I want you to remember from this is the options here, there's many of them. What they're looking for is strong scholarship, academic drive. They're looking for students that have a sense of purpose and what they want to do in the world through service and leadership, be strong ambassadors to build relationships between our countries, and to do so in a way that is thoughtful and in some cases innovative. If this all sounds good to you and you're also like, I don't know that that's me, don't worry about that. It's probably more you than you think because you're either here in person or watching this uh, on the live stream. And so at least come in and talk to us. The one thing that we encourage more than anything is that conversation, because oftentimes students will see these sort of big flashy titles and self-select out, like I could never possibly. Trust me on this, almost every student who has gone through this process and made it to any part of the process, including receiving these awards, has gone through that, We're like, I don't think I can do this, or I don't know that that's me. And that's a great place to start because you're going to approach it with humility and with authenticity, and that will create a much stronger application. So regardless of how far you go through the process, you will have something to be very, very proud of. All right, so quick review. Marshall, all UK, Gates Cambridge for Cambridge University, uh, Rhodes is for Oxford, and the Mitchell is for Ireland. Now, Jesse's going to talk about one of the other all UK options, which is even bigger than that, and that's Fulbright. Yeah. yeah. Thanks, Greg. Yeah. Um, and so usually... Um, uh, the through line for many of these applications begins with Fulbright, at least in my experience. And so uh, that's because Fulbright is open to uh, applications in over 140 different countries. And so we've had students that have applied to Fulbrights in other part, uh, parts of the world and then also applied to a Marshall Mitchell Rhodes Gates Cambridge. Um, but we also have students every year that uh, will start with a Fulbright application to the United Kingdom and then also apply to one of the Mitchell, Marshall, Gates, Cambridge, uh, all of that. Um, and so what's yeah, nice yeah. about the Fulbright um, is what they have in the United Kingdom are called partnership awards. And so if this is entirely new to you and you haven't even really considered studying in the UK before, and it's like, I don't even know what universities exist, I would start with a Fulbright application because you can go to their website and you, uh, which is uh, us.fulbrightonline.org. Um, we want to make sure that you're applying to the student program, not the uh, Fulbright Scholar program. That is for faculty members. Make sure we make that distinction clear. Um, but if you click on the United Kingdom, what you're going to find is there's about 50 or so partnership institutions. Uh, many of those, and you'll see, it's like one Fulbright Fellowship at, um, um, oh goodness, well, uh, uh, Cambridge and one uh, at Oxford, and then you'll see one at the University of Sheffield, and then one at the University of Reading. Sorry, I was like, think I was forgetting my uh, my UK institutions for a hot second. Um, and sometimes you'll see that phrased as one award for uh, for an academic slash study award. Uh, and if it's left very vague, what that means is any graduate degree program at the University of Reading or Sheffield or any of the partnership institutions 
um, any graduate degree program there is eligible. You'll see that there are a few uh, that are very field specific. So maybe it's a master's degree uh, in global health, or maybe it's a master's degree, uh, something in the creative arts. Uh, and if that's not you, then great, you can just let that out. Uh, but I think it's great to start with the Fulbright Awards because you can see what are some major institutions that are eligible, and then you can start digging into those, find what best vibes with your graduate degree interests, um, and then we can start looking at, okay, so because for Marshall, you can, uh, I believe you can apply to two institutions, your top, and then you have your backup, if, I, if I'm correct. Um, and then uh, we can start looking at, um, like I said, the uh, the programs at that institution that work best for you. Um, and so with so with Fulbright, it's the same thing. It's going to be covering uh, your graduate degree, your travel expenses, everything that you need. This is three letters of recommendation. Um, and the two essays that you're going to be writing are very similar to what you're going to be writing for any of the other applications. They're looking for um, why do you need to be studying in the United Kingdom specifically? Why do you need to be pursuing this graduate degree program? What is the nature of that program? Because some um, uh, may also uh, involve research experience. Not all of them will. Uh, so we want to know what are the coursework that you're taking, but also will there be a thesis component? If so, what are you going to be doing with that? Um, and then there's a one-page personal statement attached to that as well. Um, the Eligibility is going to be essentially the same as what you're going to see for any, everything that Craig talked about. Um, and as you can clearly see, um, the deadlines for all of these programs are going to be concurrent. And so you're going to be working on a Fulbright application the same time you're working on a Gates, the same time you'd be working on a Rhodes. Um, and so like Craig said, the easiest thing to do right now is to set up an appointment with us so we can sit down, talk about your goals, talk about your plans, talk about what institution in the United Kingdom would be the best fit for you. And then we can start setting a plan for what your summer looks like. Because we know many of our students uh, may be studying abroad this summer, may be pursuing internships, may be researching and have very busy schedules. And so we want to make sure that we're at the forefront of this, of this application. So we make sure uh, maybe we can allocate some time during the summer when you know you're going to be your busiest uh, to allow you to focus on that opportunity that you're pursuing. Um, the other item that can be really helpful when it comes to starting this process early is, uh, for example, for Fulbright, um, what you're going to need to do, and this is one of those processes where you're applying to a Fulbright separate from your application to the university. Uh, and so Fulbright uh, requires for 99% of the countries that you would be applying to uh, what is called a letter of affiliation. Uh, and that's essentially someone in the country or at the institution that you're wanting to apply to saying they'd be willing to work with you, support you through your research, support you through that graduate degree program. Uh, most universities abroad um, will shut down over the summer. Like, for example, if you're applying to a Fulbright to France, they will not respond until maybe, I don't know, uh, around October, or maybe around the deadline. Um, now, and, and so the nice thing for a Fulbright application to the United Kingdom and so those letters of affiliation uh, are optional. Your acceptance to the university will essentially serve as your affiliation letter. So you would have that safety net. But for any student that I'm working with on an application to the UK is if you can make that contact, if you can make the connections at that institution, you absolutely should do it. You still have the option to attach an affiliation letter. Um, and so you want to make sure that you're reaching out to those institutions and that faculty uh, to early uh, to make sure that you're establishing contact. Um, now, for like Craig already mentioned, um, it's the Gates Cambridge is the only one where you technically don't have to work with our office. Of course, we would highly encourage you to do so. Uh, but Fulbright is one of those opportunities, again, uh, where if, if you're applying, I don't even think you can as, a, um, as an undergraduate, you have to apply through your uh, undergraduate institution. But say if you're, uh, if you're attending today and you are currently a senior and you'll be graduating this semester, but you're wanting to pursue a Fulbright, technically as an alumnus, you can apply at large. Um, and, and apply entirely on your own. Um, the drawback of doing that is, um, well, one, you're not going to be getting the advising and the support throughout your application, um, but you're also not going to be getting what is called a campus committee evaluation form. It's a CCE form. Uh, and that is if you go through our process, meet our deadlines, interview with our campus committee, uh, one of the faculty members on your committee will be uh, writing essentially what is about a, a one to a one and a half page endorsement of your application, your research, the plan that you have for yourself. Um, and 
when done well, when the students are prepared, they interview well, their applications are stellar, uh, those one pages can add so much more depth to your application that I would highly encourage you to go through our process rather than apply on your own. Um, and so, again, we've been kind of touching on this throughout the uh, throughout the um, presentation, but these applications are extremely dense, um, as, as specifically with Fulbright. Uh, you have two large essays that you need to write. You need three letters of recommendation. You need one to three letters of, of affiliation. You need a transcript, your CCE form. We are here to help you manage all of those elements to make sure that you are reaching out to the people you need to be reaching out to on time to give them enough time to write these letters or these letters of affiliation, uh, but to make sure that you're getting everything in on time, especially say if you're an artist uh, and you're applying for a graduate degree program and you need to submit your portfolio for your medium, that's an additional element that we need to work on prior to uh, the deadline. Um, we'll make sure that we'll sit down with you and talk about um, like for roads where you need to submit anywhere from five to eight letters of recommendation, like who are the best professors, faculty, um, bosses that you've had, you know, because uh, who are the best people to speak to your skill set? Um, and then, yes, we will sit down with you. We're going to work on uh, all of these essays with you, but then we also have some upcoming um, writing workshops. And so for this semester, uh, we have April 12th and, and March 8th. Um, and actually, yeah, so it's uh, literally coming. I, I'm losing my mind. Uh, this uh, this uh, presentation next week is actually going to be in partnership with the Writing Center on campus, and we'll sit down with you, break down some of these common prompts that we see for these applications, and teach you how to approach this. Um, but we do hold some uh, that are more specific to Fulbright later in the semester, to, uh, where we'll pair you with someone else who is applying, applying to a, a completely different country in many cases, uh, so you can read each other's materials and provide feedback. Um, but also, uh, I have been working with Fulbright for many years. Dr. Filer has been working with these a little bit longer than I have, just a little bit, barely. Uh, <laughs> and so we have years worth of alumni that have applied to these applications, that have done these opportunities. Uh, we would love to put you in contact with them so they can speak about their experiences abroad, how that has not just impacted their graduate study, but have now uh, impacted their uh, career plans. Um, and so again, it's another benefit of working with us. Um, now we wanna make sure that in talking about all of this, yes, we have recipients for Rhodes, came, the Gates Cambridge Scholarship, Fulbright. Um, and, but every year we have students that apply to these opportunities um, who have stellar applications, but they are not nominated uh, for no other reason than that these are competitive opportunities. Um, but every year we also have students that because they took this process seriously, because they submitted a really compelling application, because they reached out to that institution to build connections, uh, they still earn acceptance to those universities. And in many cases, when applying to graduate school in the, in the United Kingdom, if you're accepted into the uh, university as an international student, they will automatically put you through the ringer. Um, that sounds that's not the right wording. They're not going to fight you or anything, but they are going to put your application through their process to determine which scholarships are you eligible for, uh, and that maybe that requires you to write an additional short essay. Um, but many students every year don't receive the Fulbright, they don't receive the Rhodes, or they don't receive the Marshall, but they still are able to receive a scholarship assistance and still pursue that degree in the United Kingdom. Um, and so you don't know unless you try, is what I'm trying to say. Um, and so make sure, and again, as you're working with us, we'll be focusing on the fellowship side of things, but make sure you also know when you need to apply to the institution uh, to earn acceptance. Uh, and it's sometimes hard with Fulbright to make sure that those deadlines um, are concurrent. Usually you're going to apply um, at the late fall or the beginning of the spring semester after you've applied to the fellowship, but that's more uh, information we can get in later once we're in the throes of the application process. Um, but yes, uh, we are here to help you through all of this, you know, speak to uh, not just us, but speak to your mentors like in your field, they will be able to provide you excellent feedback on your application, or perhaps on your research proposal, depending on your application, uh, and we'll be able to point you in the right direction for additional resources that you may need. Um, this is our contact information. Um, so please feel free to reach out to either myself or Bonnie uh, when it comes to Fulbright. We would be happy to speak with you soon. Um, any of the other UK 
Medicaid fellowships, reach, uh, reach out to Dr. Filer, uh, and then I'll be um, helping Craig in this coming cycle for the Marshall application. So happy to work with you. Uh, but let us know if you have any questions right now in the chat. Um, please feel free to type those in um, or for those attending in person. Um, if you have any questions about these scholarships or studying abroad in the UK in general, uh, we'd be happy to address them now. Um, or if you feel more comfortable, of course, feel free to email us. But thank you all so much uh, for attending. Yeah. Questions? Yeah, I have a question. So I'm I'm an international student for the US. So I saw that only the Gates Cambridge I'm mm -hmm. eligible for. But still, you you guys have mentioned that even as international students in the UK, the yeah. the, the universities will endorse. And, yeah. Well, even for Rhodes too, like Rhodes has perfect so actually Rhodes and Fulbright are both um international awards. You just wouldn't apply through the US. Yeah. Right. So mm -hmm. with the Roads, it's this is a vestige of colonialism. It's kind of okay, I guess. Basically, any former British colony has Rhodes scholars, right? Uh, and so, like Australia, they have a Rhodes process. Botswana has a Rhodes process. Like, and so, if if at any time England was a colony <laughs> colonizing there, they usually have a Rhodes scholar or two. I'm from Lebanon, so my father and I are France. So, okay. Okay. Yeah. so yeah. Um, and Fulbright, it works both directions. And so while this may not help you go to the UK, yeah. the way Fulbright works, if you ever wanted to come back here for graduate study, Lebanon mm -hmm. would have a Fulbright program mm -hmm. to come back here to the US to graduate study. Yeah, and there's some other programs we work with that, that are eligible for for international students. As uh, these particular ones, for the most part, are going to be for U.S. citizens. Yeah, for Fulbright, some dual citizens can apply Sometimes. in certain cases. But I'm also currently working with a student that does not have U.S. citizenship yet, but is in the process of applying and will have it, hopefully, you know, uh, by before their Fulbright would start. And so uh, in, in those cases, we're more than happy to work with you as well. But um, but yeah, feel free to reach out to us and we can. I can still work with you guys for the Cambridge. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. We'd be happy to. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I have a question because my like my background is mostly academic. Do they do they seek like extracurriculum? Like, like I wouldn't think of it necessarily as extracurricular. I, I like to have you think of it as more like co-curricular. What are you doing inside the classroom and outside the classroom that supports what you're doing in the classroom? That usually reads a little better. That's why we talk about like students that have done research or internships that sort of support what they're doing. Yeah, like right now, um, I got a job for the first time tutoring, but in the summer, I'm actually going to do research. Just would that help? Okay. Absolutely. What um what year are you? I'm so. I'm a senior, but I still have I was, would still have two semesters. So you graduate next year. Next year, yeah. So okay, so computer science. So yeah, the the fact that you're getting some research experience, so like that's more important. That granted, if you're doing like I don't know, like ultimate frisbee and that's your thing and you love it, that's also great. Yeah. Right. But they're not looking for like stacked resumes where it's like, oh, look at all these various things you've done. They're looking for more intentional engagement where you can make the connections for them. Well, I've been doing this organization, like I'm really passionate about Habitat for Humanity or whatever, because I like to go build houses and it fits in with what I want to do here in this way, shape, or form. Uh, and so it's not necessarily about having a large number of extracurriculars, it's being very, um, it's being able to articulate how the things that you have done are all working together to get you where you're going. And in my experience, that usually starts with a strong foundation of what I would call co-curricular activities and then the extracurricular activities, if that makes sense. Yeah, I, I get what you mean. I mean, I've done like MUN in high school, like Model United Nations, but that's it. Yeah, high school is really not going to come into play at this point because the first thing they will say if you start celebrating something you did in high school is what? Well, why haven't you done anything in college? Yeah. So, yeah, we never want to highlight stuff in high school unless they specifically ask for it. Or unless you like. Unless it contrasts. Yeah, like, unless, unless for some reason, like you worked with Stephen Hawking as a high school student at something that's like off the charts. Yeah. Like, okay, live, fine, we'll talk about that. But for the most part, the things in high school sort of should have prepared you and sort of led you into the things that you're doing in college or directed you away from things you did more than you in college, I suppose. Yeah. yeah. But I mean, and sometimes too, it really depends on 
how you tell your narrative, uh, sometimes not necessarily what the narrative is. Like when our Bates scholar from a few years ago um, spoke to giving tours on the on the Wakulla River, boat tours on the Wakulla River, uh, because I mean they did have a passion for for water quality, for the environment, you know, for preservation. So there was a reason why they shared it. You know, but it's like, I don't know, I guess that's not something you would naturally think of uh, when you're thinking of a, a Gates application. But the way he told that narrative was just, I, I, I mean, it was beautiful and clearly very compelling to the review committee as well. Um, so it really just depends. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's mm -hmm. about execution, basically. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Also, if you haven't done the Wakulla River boat tour, I'm going to get it. It's not necessarily, don't, don't worry about, oh, I've got a good start doing this or the other. Like if you've got some things planned that make a lot of sense in terms of just things that are prepare you for graduate school and things that are going to prepare you for your career. And then once you have that baseline, expand that thought process out a little bit. It's like, okay, what am I trying to do? Both short-term, not short-term, both, I hate to say graduate school is like small vision, but like, like what's my, my, my particular plan, but also like, What's my impact going to be? What am I trying to do? Why is this important to me? Why do I want to do this? So that you can expand your narrative out, you ground it in very specific things that you have done and use it to illustrate the path that you believe you're on. Yeah, so the bigger picture. Yeah. Exactly. Because they're all, these folks are looking for a bigger picture thinkers. And it doesn't mean that you have to, to this point, be a bigger picture actor. Because everybody's journey is a little bit different. Everyone's access to resources are going to be a little bit different. But they do want to see that, like, what have you been doing over your college career? And then how does that prepare you for whatever this sort of visionary piece is? Yeah. All right. Anybody else? All right. Well, thank you all for coming. Have a great afternoon. Thanks, Sean. I hope your brain didn't melt. It's a lot of, lot of technical stuff. I mean, we'll send out this presentation uh, to everybody that signed up here or just make sure you're signed up there and we'll send a follow-up email with a link to the presentation as well and an invitation to reach back out. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, do, we, do we schedule a meeting with you guys or will you guys contact us? Let's say we'll send all of this out. That way you have it the email and you can just ping us back. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Thanks, y'all.